Um, our next speaker, uh, Carrie uh, Butel, is here from UC San Diego, where she um, is a member of both the departments of pediatrics, very apropos to the last talk, and psychiatry, and also is a part of the joint doctoral program between San Diego State University um, and UCSD. And uh, Dr. Uh, Butel has been involved over the last 20 plus years in numerous studies, both epidemiologic studies as well as clinical trials focused on overweight, obesity, binge eating, and behavioral aspects associated with, uh, with body weight gain and food consumption. Um, those uh, uh, studies really focus along two basic lines. One has to do with optimizing and uh, creating the most community translatable versions of current behaviorally uh, uh, associated methods at improving dietary habits. And then uh, another focus is trying to integrate uh, those clinical goals with basic science understanding about uh, what drives food, uh, uh, food seeking and food uh, consumption behaviors to try to create the next generation of uh, behavioral treatment strat strategies trying to produce even better uh, ways to control uh, unwanted uh, patterns of food intake. So um, with that, we're really happy to have Carrie. One last little plug um, is that uh, the um, SSEW and the Diabetes Center here at UCSF and um, the Nutrition Obesity Research Center also jointly fund um, pilot and feasibility studies. And so if you're interested in thinking about a study with people or a basic uh, model, focused on a question that really you feel passionate about, please contact people at these um, individual institutions at UCSF because there may be an opportunity to get some money for you to, uh, to do that work. And we're trying to diversify the money that we um, uh, let, uh, provide to investigators to do interesting work. So um, please don't hesitate and don't think that there's no way to get a few thousand dollars uh, to um, start something that you think could be cool. Okay, so with that, Carrie, uh, welcome and uh, we look forward to your comments too. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm absolutely honored to be here. I'm even more excited because my plane almost didn't take off today from San Diego. We went to take off, then we went back, then we went to take off, then we went back. So luckily it came and I'm able to give my talk because I might have had to push it off on somebody else. Um, and before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about my acknowledgments in my lab. So I'm the director of the Center for Healthy Eating and Activity Research at UCSD. Um, all we do is research on um, treating and managing eating behavior. Um, and I have to really thank all of these people, <laughs> and it doesn't even include the 25 students that work for us, because if you do treatment studies, it is really, really hard, and it takes an awful lot of people. So I get to stand here and give my talk, but in reality, these people are behind it, really helping me do all of this work. So um, just to start off, I show a lot of pictures, and I show a lot of pictures of food, just to warn you. Um, so it's good we're going to lunch next. So uh, for those of you who don't know, um, two-thirds of American adults are overweight or obese. When you look at kids, it's about a third of them. Um, the way that we used to treat, or the way that we do treat obesity in, in certain models is that you try to change the caloric balance, right? So we meet with people, we tell them to eat better, exercise more, we use behavior therapy principles to help it make more likely that these things are going to happen. Um, and with kids, we use parenting techniques, right? Um, unfortunately, if you look, the percentage of people who lose weight in those kinds of programs is about 50%. And then four years later, of the people who lost weight, the, that little red triangle is the amount of people who retained it. With kids, it's a little bit better, but about, there's only one study actually, but it looks like about a third of kids who participate in a program like this are no longer overweight in adulthood. So my question to you is, why are these results so grim? Um, Ashley did an absolutely beautiful job setting up my talk. I don't think I could have prompted you any better. <laughs> but let me tell you a little bit about how this line of research started. So um, as you know, I do some kind of translational research where we try to take behavioral treatments and translate them to the clinic or make them uh, more apt to be used by more lay people. But this side of the work comes all from this girl that I saw in Minnesota. So we were doing a parent-child treatment. Um, she was about, I think, 10 at the time. 
And the mom came into us and didn't know what to do. And it's because this child came in and said, what are we gonna have for snack? What are we gonna have for snack? What are we gonna have for dinner? I'm not full yet, can I have another snack? And she was making her mother crazy, right? And as a good clinical psychologist, what I said is, oh, something's obviously wrong with her, I must get her tested, right? Nothing, everything was within normal limits, she didn't have OCD, she didn't have all the stuff I was looking for. So, I started to think about how did this happen? You know, how does someone become so interested or motivated by food? So as Ashley said, um, kids are exposed to, kids and adults are exposed to all kind of food cues every day. I mean, even on the plane today, <laughs> I was amazed at what was coming up. Um, and part of what we've left out of our treatments, as Ashley again set up very well for me, is the brain, you know, and how our brain responds to food. And so some of the program of research that I'm gonna to talk to you about today is all about how to exert more control in an environment that's difficult. And so do I believe, I, I wanna add in a caveat, I believe that prevention is the number one way to deal with this. I'm just gonna put it out there. I also don't think this is gonna ch change for decades. So right now, my work is really about how to um, help people live in the current environment and potentially be healthier. So um, a lot of what, what we think, and as Ashley described, and Nora Volkow and others have talked about this idea, and it, again, it's based on an addiction model, is that there's this expectation of reward or actual reward from taste, which is balanced with the ability to inhibit your behavior. So let's talk a little bit about the expectation of reward. And this is just really basic. I'm bringing it down to basic so that it would be more digestible for everybody. But if you wanna hear more of the details, I'm happy to. We do know that when people expect or think about food, they can start to salivate and we can start to see changes in heart rate. These are anticipatory physiological changes that are learned. On the other side, we have inhibition mechanisms and a lot of our work around inhibition comes out of Aaron Ad Adams' model. Um, which talks about, same picture, Ashley, um, <laughs> how, how you can inhibit your thoughts, you can inhibit your emotions, and you can inhibit your behavior. In particular, some of our work now is working on this inhibition of behavior and inhibition of attention. So if you think about this balance, right, in someone that can live today, so there are people today that do not gain weight like others. And I don't want to minimize the physiological reasons why that happens. As Ashley said, obesity is terribly complex. It is not one size fits all. I never want to say that. But in terms of our work, you know, we're thinking about this reward versus inhibition balance and what can happen. So what we know does happen at some level is that reward, as Ashley said, the foods become more rewarding for certain people. And then Additionally, we know, at least from my animal research colleagues, that some parts of the brain that are associated with inhibition actually are affected. So if you think about the balance, if you have a drive to overeat and you don't have the ability to knock down those behaviors or thoughts, you're gonna end up overeating. So the way that we think about this is food cues are associated, are interpreted through the brain. Then you have these anticipatory physiological changes right? <laughs> Which means that you overeat. So, I know I like the cat pictures too. So we started thinking, how can we develop interventions based on this? And this is the thing that I'm most passionate about. And so some of the areas in terms of cognition that we're looking at are learning, attention, inhibition, and memory. And I'm not going to talk about our line of research right now on memory because I don't have enough time but I can certainly talk to anybody who's interested. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is learning and inhibition. So let's think about food cues, right? How does it happen? Here we are in good old Pavlov's dog, right? Who Pavlov had a bell that didn't have any salivation response in the dog. Eventually when the bell was paired with food, the, um, you saw salivation and then ultimately the bell was associated with salivation, right? That's a very, very basic Pavlovian response. This is today's modern day Pavlov's dog, right? If the ice cream man goes by, what do kids do? Ah, you can see them, they get excited. <laughs> 
So what we know is that over time, once this relationship is learned, that food cues can be associated with salivation, physiological arousal, such as heart rate variability, neural activity, such as in the ventral striatum, and other areas, and then we interpret it as craving and wanting. So think about it this way. If you are sitting on the couch every night at 10 o'clock, and you eat chocolate, and then over time what happens is you sit on the couch at 10 o'clock, you start having these anticipatory physiological changes, which are interpreted many times as craving and wanting. Then you eat the food, then your physiological arousal goes down, and then you decrease the craving, and then you're back in the same situation at 10 o'clock the next night. So we were really interested, again, in do certain people learn these relationships better? And we have a new grant, knock on wood, that, um, that should be coming in that will look at this in children, this kind of ability to learn these relationships. But we did a really basic study. Um, the woman on the left is one of my graduate students. The woman on the right is Vicki Risbro. She does fear conditioning. She scares people. <laughs> And so what we did was we actually did the modern day Pavlov's experiment. We associated a, a shape such as a square with a little taste of chocolate milkshake. We did a circle with a taste of water and then there actually was a triangle that was associated with nothing. And I'm not gonna talk about that because it, it complicates everything. And what we measured in this study was EMG swallowing. I hook people up to wires all the time now. <laughs> it's kind of funny. So that's Vicky showing us how the, the wires are hooked up. And what we did was we paired these things 16 times only, and we looked at overweight versus healthy weight participants. On the left, this, the graph is um, chocolate milkshake minus water. So it's the part that's attributed to the fat and sugar. So if you look on the left, um, the, the healthy weight people, the dark bar, and the people that were overweight and obese had the light bar. This is number of swallows. And so as you can see, just after 16 pairings from baseline to the second point, the people that were overweight and obese were more likely to salivate in so many words. So maybe there's a phenotype of someone who's set up to learn these relationships. So in terms of developing treatment, again, if we talk about somehow or other, I've become an expert in Pavlovian conditioning. Um, I've had to learn a lot of this from my colleagues that do animal research. But the way that we think about it is if you want to break that pairing, right, you do extinction, which means in Pavlovian life, you show the bell over and over without pairing it with food, and over time the salivation will decrease. So from this, we created a program. Um, we call it Q Exposure Treatment for Food. I'd like to say that I created it out of my own brain. I didn't. They do this in substance abuse and it's had very mixed results. But the concept is that you continually um, expose people to their highly craved cues without eating them. So um, what we try to do is we try to decrease this physiological arousal to food while at the same time enhancing the ability to resist it or inhibit it. With kids, this is, I'll just show you some papers, or some handouts, but we have this craving volcano um, and the kids talk about their cravings on a scale of one to five. We're doing an adult study now, and now we have it one to seven for the adults. We have them keep track of their cravings during the day, and then we have them identify their eight most highly craved foods, at least in these early studies. With the adult studies, we're now doing a year treatment. But you come up with your highly craved foods, and essentially what we do is we have people look at it and rate their cravings, smell it and rate their craving, take a small taste and rate their cravings. Um, we have them rate before and after how good they expect it to feel and um, how much they want it and how much they like it. And so over time, this is what happens, is that cravings always go up before they go down. So it looks like this. And for those of you who do basic research, this is a habituation graph. Right? But if people can learn to resist their cravings for that first 10, 15, two minutes, whatever it is, they might be less likely to eat. Um, in the study I'm going to tell you about, we had another arm which looked at appetite, and Ashley talked a little bit about that, but I can talk to you about hunger nonstop for a long time if you want to. I'm just going to tell you we did this appetite training as the other side. The other thing that I wanted to say is that we measure eating in the absence of hunger. And so what our lab is interested in is people who eat when they're physically full. 
I never want to tell a child not to eat if they're physically hungry. But there's a difference between head hunger, cravings, and stomach hunger, which is true hunger. So we give them dinner as part of the study, and then we make sure that they're full, and then we have them taste 11 foods, and then we leave them alone for 10 minutes in there. The researcher says, oh, I got to go next door, blah, 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 and then we measure how much they eat. So I'm just going to briefly go over this. This was our first paper on it. I didn't know how this thing was going to work. So these are all relatively small studies. Um, like I said, we're doing a fully powered adult study, but I'm going to tell you about some of the studies that led up to it. Um, and what we did here was we just had 36 kids, and we looked for kids that were high on that EAH. And as Ashley was speaking, I was thinking, oh, if we had had the food addiction scale back then, I'm betting they would have scored high. This was the easiest study I've ever had to recruit for. It was because pe parents were so happy that someone knew what they were talking about. Because they go to their physician and they, they're told, oh, just feed them less, don't give them that, blah, blah, blah. You know, and the kids obsessively thinking about food, sneaking food, whatever it is, overeating at a party, taking you know, the bowl and eating straight out of the bowl really quickly. I mean, we can talk about eating rate up and down too. But anyhow, when we put flyers out for this, people came out of the woodwork. Um, and so what we did was we just did an eight-week program. So again, this is just a feasibility study, and we measured eating in the absence of hunger, how they felt about um, feeling in control. We measured with an interview how many overeating episodes they had. We looked at their caloric intake and changes in BMI. And again, this is a really short program, but the most important thing that we learned from this study was that compared to the appetite training, the Q exposure treatment decreased eating in the absence of hunger. It, put it, it decreased it by almost half. Um, these kids ate 250 less calories in that eating in the absence of hunger evaluation that we did. And I'd like to say that it was reactionary, but if you look at the kids that went through the other arm, they didn't change at all. So I felt a little bit more confident in this, but either way, 250 calories, if a child eats 250 calories less every day, they'll prevent weight gain of eight to 10 pounds. So it's a big number, although it seems small. Um, what ended up happening was that when we did this Q exposure treatment, people got really confused about what is hunger and what is craving. And again, you heard me talk about our explanation now, but back then I didn't have that. So now what we talk about is head hunger, craving, stomach hunger, true hunger. So what we did was we took the two treatments, the Q exposure treatment and the appetite awareness training, and we combined them into a program we call ROC, or Regulation of Cues. Um, we published a study, oh, interesting. We published a study on, with kids on this. I think this is an older version of my slides, which is interesting. We published a study with kids. I'll just kind of skip over it pretty quickly. Um, and then we had a study with adults, which this study with adults was our pilot data for our large randomized trial now. And what, I, what we did in this trial, it was an open label trial, so there's no control group. But we took 28 overweight people who binge eat. And we gave them a four month rock program. Um, and it was fascinating. I mean, some of the stories that come out of this, I will tell you that if you do Q exposure treatment, if you smell things and eat them really slow and pay attention, you learn that you don't like them. And Dana Small, said when I saw her last summer that the, that the motivation system and the liking system are potentially different. So you don't have to like something to eat it, at least in this scenario. So um, we put them through the ROC program. I'll just tell you, we saw changes on everything we wanted to see. Yay for me. Um, but we saw changes in BMI. I'm always happy when people lose weight because you never know what's going to happen in these small studies because there's so much variability. Um, but we saw changes in people people lost almost a full BMI point. There is no diet, no physical activity. We didn't prescribe any of that. We have periodically thought about prescribing a low glycemic diet because that would fit with the model. But right now, the way that we're testing it is we want to see, we let people eat whatever they want. They just eat less of it. So what's ended up happening, and I wish I was going to show a video, but um, it has a patient in it, and I, I'm not comfortable with it being filmed, so I, I won't show it. Um, but essentially, what the kid talks about, it's like a 12-year-old girl. She's all squirmy and stuff. And she talks about how she's learned that she just needs the first taste. She doesn't need to finish it when she's craving, and she's able to push it away. 
So um, we saw changes on how food responsive the kids are, how much they pay attention to food in the environment. So anyhow, we're, we're doing some ongoing work with that. We have a study where we're testing just Q exposure with kids. Um, we're doing it with Mark Bouton and Michelle Krask. Michelle Krask is um, an anxiety researcher that probably knows the most about exposure treatments of anybody I know. Um, so we're ongoing with that study. It's actually been pretty fun. But I have to tell you, we have so much junk food in my lab. It's everywhere. <laughs> because what people crave is very specific. So if you're somebody who puts like brownie on your list of favorite foods, right? And I give you a brownie from Costco, well maybe that's okay. Um, I, you, you like Nordstrom brownies. But I give you a brownie from Costco, it's not gonna raise your cravings as much. So people get really specific. So part of what our students do is drive around the city and pick up their foods. Because if we're gonna do it, we gotta do it with stuff that means something. If I do it with my foods, it doesn't mean it'll work for you. So anyhow, we're, we're doing that study. We're also testing context in that study. So we're doing the extinction training at home, at a food court, and then um, at our lab. So we're looking at whether or not training people in these different settings generalizes more. Um, it'll probably be four or five years before we get all this data out. But um, anyhow, that's one way we're going. So um, I do want to say, you know, the other piece that we've been studying is attention bias. and. Um, as Ashley, again, set me up, <laughs> is that um, people who are apt to gain weight have selective processing of food cues. So the best way to think about this is I have patients who sit in my office who say, if there's chocolate cake in the refrigerator, I can't stop thinking about it until I have it. So it takes on this kind of, you know, in psychology we call it rumination. Just thinking about, thinking about, thinking about it till you have it. Again, thinking about the whole model of learning, this is learned, but we do know that um, attention bias, how quickly someone pays attention to food cues, when there's neutral cues there, is an indication of how potentially rewarding it is. We do know that attention bias, how quickly someone pays attention, is related to eating. Um, we've published two studies on this. Um, one, so what we're doing is we're doing attentional retraining. So we're seeing if we could train people who are more likely to pay attention to food cues to pay attention to other things. It's way more complicated than it sounds. But there are computer programs and all kinds of things. You guys know Lumosity, right? That brain training stuff. Um, so it's similar to that, except for our program's really boring. It's so boring. I gotta figure out a way to make it less boring. But we've now published two papers, one with kids and one with adults. I'll show you the, the adult data. And this, again, is really interesting to me. It's an eight-week attention bias training program. They did it twice at home, and they did it once in the lab. So we had them come in once a week just to kind of keep them in the study. And essentially what we saw is we saw changes in binge eating. We saw changes in eating disorder um, symptoms. We saw changes in BMI. No diet, no physical activity, just the attentional training. Now, there was not a control group, so maybe if everybody comes and sees me, they're going to lose weight, which would be great. <laughs> I can show you all the studies that that didn't happen. Um, I'm just showing you the ones that work today. But, but in, reality, in reality, what we found is that we actually had people in this study who asked to keep it. Can I keep this program? It's helping me not think about it. So who knows? Um, this was a very small study. It was about, like I think it was 12 people. We lost three, so we really only have data on nine or 10. But this part was even more interesting to me. Look at these numbers. I don't see this with behavioral weight loss at all. It does not mean that this is gonna work for everybody, but the fact that someone lost six, six, seven, eight, ten 10 pounds over eight weeks with no diet, no physical activity, just doing this little computer program thing, maybe we're onto something, I don't know. I don't wanna say that it's definitive, but there are all these other targets that we can be targeting to help address some of the food addiction, some of the cravings, some of these other pieces um, that we've really kind of ignored over time. So, um, as I said, there are these number of targets. I'm not gonna have time to talk about the memory piece, but what I want you to think about is putting the brain back in our treatments, and um, hopefully I'll have some other results to show you in a while. So this is San Diego, just to give a pitch, and I'll take any questions.
I can understand on the disinhibition what you did with regard to desensitizing the cues, but on your attention, I don't really understand what your, your intervention was that yeah. got so, such... Um, an attention bias training, what it is is it's an implicit training. So it means that um, you sit in front of a computer and there would be a picture of food and a picture of a neutral object. And then right afterwards, there will be a probe, like an X or a Y or something, and then you've got to push a button. Essentially what we do is the probe is in the space of the neutral object 90% of the time and 10% in the place of the food. So the idea is implicitly training attention. Um, I didn't, again, I didn't create this. I just borrowed it from my good friends in anxiety because they're years ahead of us. Um, but this is used in anxiety treatments and has, um, has actually some really interesting outcomes. Thank you for listening. I'm fascinated by your work with kids. We are definitely seeing these kids. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-
we don't do well with moderate. We do better with abstinence, and you cannot do that here. And so even though someone goes through these programs, they still see all those pictures every day, and they, they, people offer them M&Ms at work and all kinds of stuff. So it kind of, the way I think about it is it kind of knocks, it's like it, it, it kind of knocks it down. So again, prevention is the key, but I don't really know. Well, great. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, everyone. By the way, I'll put this up. Um, this is called the shift diagram. I usually show it in all of my presentations, but these are all the things that contribute to obesity and overweight. There's, um, there's a website where you can go and you can click on them. They're like psychosocial, emotional, um, environmental, all that kind of stuff. And so this is why we're not that good yet. <laughs>